Yes, so. So, uh, my name is Ala Karnowski, and I'm going to talk to you about um, bioinformatics tools for analysis of metabolomics data. But uh, I really would like to, uh, you know, since I'm talking about tools and databases and so on and so forth, I would like to point out a few um, tools, both uh, free open source tools and commercial that you can actually use. And some of these implement uh, the uh, algorithms and methods that George mentioned. But, you know, first, uh, we were very concerned that you guys would get lost in this whole sort of, you know, analysis cycle. So that's a slide that you have seen a number of times today. And uh, so I'm going to really talk about these two things. And uh, so basically, you know, we try to separate them so it, it's a big topic and so we can actually you know, describe it uh, the best possible way. But uh, those of you who have worked with high throughput data, maybe, you know, gene expression data or something like this, or some metabolomics data, know that these are really inseparable. So it's kind of very hard to draw the line. It, you know, every step of data analysis has implications for the following steps. And so uh, this is essentially an overview uh, of the sort of different steps in uh, data analysis workflow, and that's what George referred to as low, middle level, and high level analysis. And I'm not going to talk about uh, low level analysis, and I'm only going to touch on some of the uh, tools for uh, this uh, type of analysis that George described in some details. And uh, for the remainder of my talk, I'll just, you know, f focus on uh, pathway mapping, pathway enrichment, network analysis, and tools for performing these tasks. Okay? So the first tool that I'm going to mention um, is called MetaboAnalyst, and this is a web-based tool, and it comes from uh, David Wishart's group at the University of Alberta in uh, Canada, and this is an overview. This is a website, and by the way, I realize that this is the end of the day, or as a long day, and this is the last uh, presentation, and you guys must be really tired. So what I want to stress is uh, I have a lot of, uh, sort of different tools to cover, but these slides are going to be available to you. And I, uh, we tried to put uh, links to all of these tools, so there is really no need to memorize all of this. And uh, you can sort of, you know, always go back and kind of look at them at your own pace if you're looking for something specific. Hopefully, we'll have a useful starting point. Okay, so nonetheless, uh, MetaboAnalyst is really a mm, big uh, software package, and it, it is all web-based, and um, it has um, R mm, on the back end, and so most of the uh, statistical methods, all the statistical methods actually are implemented in R, and um, a little bit later in my talk, I'm going to uh, mention HMDB database that was mentioned several times today by Charles, and uh, for example, and uh, so this is the same group. So um, Metabol Analyst is uh, tightly connected with some of the other databases that David Wishart's group has developed. And uh, so they essentially implement many different uh, steps in data analysis, but this group uh, is actually, I mean, the, their tools not by any means limited to analysis of, of the NMR data, but this group is primarily NMR-based, so uh, they have additional great uh, features for analysis of the NMR data. Just wanted to mention it. But um, you can do uh, lots of different tasks with it, uh, and I'm going to just you know, show you some examples and some screenshots of that with the same proof of data that has been mentioned throughout the day. Uh, so uh, it does various uh, sort of low-level tasks and um, some missing value imputation. We did not talk a whole lot about missing values, and I'm going to mention it in the uh, days to come. Uh, George mentioned it, and so uh, uh, this is obviously something that is an issue, uh, especially with untargeted metabolomics data, and that needs to be addressed very carefully. So I'll just say it and leave it at that right now. Uh, then, you know, there are various methods for uh, data normalization, and again, I will show it to you, and uh, then, you know, a number of methods for statistical analysis are available within that package, as well as uh, pathway and enrichment analysis tools. 
And uh, the best part of it is that you can actually download the report. So you don't, you're not limited to just you know screenshots that I'm going to show you today. You can actually download the uh, report. So uh, here's the uh, the overview of that uh, inter interface. As you can see, um, that's you know where you get started, and you can start by uploading your data. And uh, here on uh, the left-hand side, there is a navigation bar that shows you which, uh, you know, where, what part of data analysis you are uh, performing right now and where you are. Obviously, we are on the uh, data upload page, and so there are multiple options for uploading the data and uh, rather detailed instruction. But uh, uh, in essence, what it is, it's a very simple uh, comma delimited or tab delimited uh, text file which ha which can have samples and rows or metabolites and rows and samples and columns or vice versa and you can um, sort of you know select the appropriate uh, format from the drop down and then uh, what you do is you click on uh, submit button once you have loaded your file and uh, so I just wanted to remind you quickly uh, that uh, about that PUFA study that we talked about uh, in, you by now already know that there are uh, essentially um, control subjects and uh, people with non-alcoholic uh, non fatty liver disease in this study. And uh, the, um, these are the, you know, there were two diets, uh, polyunsaturated fat diet followed by a high carbohydrate diet, isocaloric, they don't change their weight by much. And so we have measured uh, metabolites. And so, once I have loaded that data set into MetabolNavist, that's the um, uh, uh, interface that it's going to present. I've skipped several steps there for the, in the interest of time, but essentially, you know, you can do data normalization, and it gives you uh, several different options for doing data normalization. And uh, so, um, the, uh, so, you know, a lot of times you're concerned, obviously, with, um, and George explained that, you know, there are certain assumptions about normality of the data. And so you may want to uh, look to, for example, log transform your data so it would be, be uh, more normally distributed. Uh, or you may want to uh, do the scaling. Uh, for example, you know, the, we know that uh, metabolites as we measure on very different scales altogether. And anyway, once you sort of, you know, select your options and you can just, you know, play with it and uh, essentially uh, see what the data looks like, uh, it will give you the visual representation uh, of what your data looks at. So this is sort of a before-after slide, if you will. And as you can see, this is sort of, you know, well, that's, you know, the difference of sort of doing the scaling here and sort of, you know, uh, they're in the same range. So now, uh, I, mm, I mean, Metabo Analyst is a great tool and it's very easy to use. But uh, with uh, sort of ease of use comes sort of, you know, the um, sort of, you know, the catch there really is that just because it's easy to use, just because you sort of, you know, click through all the steps, it's not necessarily going to mean that the uh, analysis that you're going to do is going to be, you know, very meaningful. So it's really, the burden is really on you. Um, mm, to make sure that um, you know the, uh, your assumptions that you're making about your data are correct and your conclusions to, uh, to which you come are valid. Okay, so I mean there is a great power in sort of you know visualizing your data. And I would frankly I would not. I mean if you have a very simple study design. So for example you know as was discussed before you have two groups. You're probably okay doing this because I mean you kind of understand your data. Once you get into more complex uh, uh, design uh, multiple groups, multiple time points, even if you get some results here. Uh, it's just like with any kind of modeling. Just because you can produce a model, it doesn't mean that your model is going to be relevant or any good, frankly. Okay, so the word of caution here is just, you know, be, be very careful. Uh, and um, so they have published several papers, and I have a reference somewhere in there including nature protocol, protocols, I believe, and some you know, very detailed descriptions on their website. So read very carefully uh, sort of, you know, how to use this tool and what algorithms 
for used and you know assumptions that are built into this. Nonetheless, uh, suppose that, suppose you perform the uh, I'm sorry, lo wrong button, went the wrong way. Uh, once you perform the normalization of the data, you can sort of you know proceed to do some statistical analysis, and it sort of you know gives you an ability to uh, do you know in this case the data that I put in, I actually um, I think I took only controls. Uh, from the data on the control samples, just to simplify it, so I just have control and uh, base at baseline and uh, two diets. And uh, so, what I'm going to show you next is how it visualizes the ANOVA. It builds this graph essentially, and this is a certain threshold. And you know, supposedly, uh, the uh, compounds that are up here are mm, significant. And uh, these are not significant down here. And so I'm uh, unlike you know what George showed you. This is using uh, all features, I believe, all features in the data, excluding uh, the uh, features or metabolites that had too many missing values. So uh, that's why I have so many different spots. But again, to point out, you can download. You know, you know, at various stages, you can sort of generate uh, and uh, sort of, you know, output it to a text file that can be later put in Excel. And at the end of your analysis, you can essentially download a complete report, which will include all the analysis uh, that you performed. So all of that, as in my point, my main point here is all of that is available in um, comma or tab delimited text that can be later put in Excel once you've downloaded it. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to show you, and so if you follow that sort of, you know, tree on the left-hand side, so this is PCA that looks pretty similar, I think, to what George showed you. It's a slightly different data set. I have fewer samples, but basically, you know, you can see that, you know, some of these are uh, sort of, you know, beginning to separate. Uh, PUFA and carbohydrate diet are beginning to separate, but there is a big sort of, you know, blob over here, which is sort of, you know, to my on you know statistically relatively sort of unexperienced eye looks like they're kind of lumped all together there. I'm not showing you a 3D view. I'm just sort of you know this is over two principal components. And by the way, um, this program uh, shows this sort of you know percent of uh, uh, that it, uh, can be sort of explained by each principal component that George mentioned and he talked about that. Okay, so this is uh, sort of, you know, this sort of quick view of PCA, and this is the implementation of um, PLSDA that George mentioned. And uh, so this is a supervised method, and so with typically, you know, what I see is uh, basically, you know, you tell, uh, tell it what are the groups in your data, and it uses them as uh, variables, and essentially, you know, it, tends to separate things a little bit better, so find a better way of separating it. Okay, that's sort of a view of that. Okay, so, but uh, the other feature of, uh, sort of, you know, PLSDA that George also mentioned is that uh, what you can get from this, you can also get a ranked list of your features. Okay, so, uh, and that's what George showed. So, in that ranked list of features, from that you can select the most significant features that you're going to focus on any type of analysis like this. What you're trying to get, you're trying to get at important features that mean something, right? And so uh, that's sort of, you know, my next slide and the transition. Uh, once you have this ranked list of features of metabolites, uh, then, you know, we can sort of go ahead and do the... Uh, pathway mapping and enrichment. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand that's sort of, you know, the goal of your experiment, right? So you want to know what it all means that this particular uh, um, small molecule is uh, upregulated or downregulated, or this group of lipids is uh, sort of, you know, changing. Uh, what does that mean biologically? How do you sort of, you know, put it into a sort of biological context? And so there is a whole host of tools for uh, pathway analysis and pathway enrichment most uh, recently. And uh, 
I, uh, so this is sort of an essentially a snapshot of them, and I'm going to uh, mention some of these tools to you. And uh, so there is a, um, and I'm going to focus primarily on the uh, tools that are publicly available, but I will mention several commercial tools. Okay. So, but before we um, talk about the tools, um, I think it's worth sort of, you know, talking for a few minutes about databases that uh, can be of some use in this type of analysis. Now, uh, when I talk about databases, what I want to say is that there are really a lot more databases out there that I'm going to uh, mention. And so I selected this. Uh, sort of because I uh, but, uh, because I sort of you know help my story and my story is uh, how do you do pathway analysis okay so it's not exhaustive it's not all inclusive and uh, most importantly uh, this for example does not cover uh, what Charles talked about like you know what databases should be used to try, try to identify or map the features that were detected in LCMS study for example right. So it's not an exhaustive list, it's just sort of a very biased list, if you will, to help my story. Okay, so the first one I already mentioned that is HMDB, and this is essentially a snapshot, and it collects a pretty large number of metabolites. Charles mentioned it in the context, like, you know, that's where he uh, looks uh, very often to identify certain metabolites, and it has a great deal of information uh, about any specific metabolite. In addition to this sort of, you know, basic information, um, it also, uh, I mean, they also have a sort of separate database uh, where they uh, collect biological pathways. And um, the uh, other, you know, feature, I think they store a lot of information about uh, um, NMR uh, spectra and, uh, of certain compounds that you know, is, is being used to uh, identify uh, the uh, features that were detected um, in NMR studies, okay? So the next database uh, has been also mentioned. Um, I think PubChem is by far the largest database of its kind, and uh, it has information about all kinds of small molecules, okay? So the things that are important to know about PubChem it's largely created uh, through automated processes. And uh, what it means is that, they're, I mean, it's not human curated, unlike, for example, HMDB, which is largely curated. Um, PubChem, uh, uh, so, you know, it has um, sort of, you know, certain quality control uh, procedures that are used by uh, NCBI staff that's, you know, who runs the um, PubChem database, but uh, that, you know, since it's not human curated, there are often sort of inconsistencies, there are mistakes, and I'll point out some of these to you, but uh, generally it consists of three different databases. Uh, substance database, for those of you who are uh, familiar with um, maybe, you know, genes and gene expression data, I would say that roughly it's equivalent of gene bank. It's a repository uh, where anybody can deposit any substances that they want. Any metabolites, for example, they detected in a study. Uh, for example, you know, just uh, all uh, compounds contain contained in another uh, pathway database that I haven't mentioned yet, but many of you may be familiar with uh, KEG. They all have been deposited and they're part of substance uh, database in PubChem. Another database, uh, another part of PubChem is a compound database. And compound database is a more curated database. So I think it's meant to be, again, an equivalent of untrained gene database, if you are familiar with that. And what it is, it's sort of, you know, a compound database supposed to, uh, every compound is supposed to be unique there, which is um, only, I mean, I think someday we will sort of, you know, reach that stage and it will be true, but right now, unfortunately, it is not. So I, I cannot tell you how many, among probably 80 million compounds, there are non-unique, but it's a non, not insignificant part. So it's very confusing. And that sort of leads me to another important issue with sort of, I mean, it's not really an issue for chemists, the way I understand it, right? So from the chemist's standpoint, everything is, 
um, great, right? So every compound has a very, you know, specific and very unique name. And, you know, there are UPAC names that sort of describe every compound. The problem is that uh, to uh, those of us who are not chemists, a lot of times these names don't mean much, okay? And so there are multiple synonyms for every compound. And these are being used in different contexts. And so uh, there is really no single unique stable identifier for compounds, okay? So where are the sort of, you know, early days, again, uh, sort of it's not inappropriate, I think, to use this analogy with uh, sort of early days of uh, genomics where genes did not have necessarily unique identifiers. So, you know, for example, Gene Bank was using one type of identifier, European uh, Europeans, especially MBL, were using sort of, you know, their own identifiers and so on and so forth. So we're in this sort of, you know, wild west sort of gold rush territory where uh, it's, you know, it's a big challenge. And, you know, many people are sort of, you know, working on it. So hopefully we will reach some, you know, better stage of affairs. But right now, uh, sort of, you know, PubChem is probably, you know, the uh, best, in some sense, it's a good identifier to use. Because uh, at least, you know, uh, PubChem is most likely to include your compound, whereas other databases, as I will show you in the subsequent days, uh, are not necessarily um, sort of, you know, um, do not necessarily have all the compounds. Now, um, speaking of the efforts to kind of harmonize that situation and to... Um, um, sort of, you know, bring a lot of uh, sort of useful information from the double omics together. This uh, particular site and this particular tool is actually from our uh, colleagues in the uh, Common Fund Metabolomics Consortium from at, at UC San Diego. It is called Metabolomics Workbench. And what this database is, it's essentially, um, it's also an NIH-funded uh, project. And uh, so this group was uh, led by Shankar Subramanian, uh, was funded to build a repository for metabolomics data, okay? And so it was mentioned that, you know, there was an expectation that uh, the, uh, you know, data, metabolomics data generated by our core and other cores would be made publicly available. Uh, and uh, so this is the place where the data would be uh, deposited. But in addition to sort of, you know, data repositories that is just sort of, you know, gathering um, speed right now. Uh, there are lots of useful uh, data and tools uh, that they have already put, uh, put together, and this certainly is a work in progress. And Steve is going to talk uh, more about, uh, sort of, you know, specifically, I believe, data, uh, you know, repository, and, you know, how to deposit data and data sharing policies and so on and so forth. So I just sort of, you know, briefly mention it as a sort of useful resource for uh, metabolomics. And there is, well, I mean, I think you can guess that there is a European equivalent, <laughs> essentially, of that. That is called Metabolites. And this is also essentially um, an effort by um, EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, to uh, build the repository for meta metabolomics data. And uh, so the now, now the two groups are actually collaborating. And um, so hopefully we will, again, reach the stage that, you know, um, that we have right now in sort of in terms of the sort of gene data and uh, gene expression data and so on and so forth. So uh, yet another re useful resource. And I will also mention, since we're going to talk about pathway enrichment and uh, sort of, you know, Go was mentioned, gene ontology was mentioned. In that regard, uh, this uh, group also developed and is hosting uh, a useful ontology for uh, metabolites that is called Chemical Entities of Biological Interest, or KEBI. So if you want to find more information about that, and this is a very useful ontology for metabolites, uh, that's... Uh, you know, that's the site to go to if you, for some reason you're interested. So now uh, sort of, you know, zooming into uh, the sort of main subject of my uh, talk, the uh, pathway databases. Okay, the first and probably the most widely used um, database of this kind is CAG. It stands, for those of you who, don't, who are not familiar with CAG, it stands for 
Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and uh, it is maintained by uh, a group in Japan. And so this uh, has um, uh, this has pretty comprehensive uh, information about uh, biological pathways, not just metabolic pathways. It also includes signaling and genetic information processing and disease pathways and so on and so forth. So it's pretty comprehensive. And uh, it includes the information about uh, um, a lot of uh, organisms as well. Okay. Uh, so this is a little bit more detailed view of CAG. Uh, so I have um, sort of, you know, just sort of an example, uh, as an example, I have glycolysis pathway and um, a snapshot of M uh, MEP kinase signaling pathway. And so many of you probably are already familiar and have seen similar maps. If you haven't gone to that site, maybe uh, you came across some of these uh, publications. And uh, it's sort of, you know, before any actual bioinformatics tools appeared for mapping things into pathways, I think that, you know, um, groups who developed such tools, I mean, got the idea from scientists. And so the sort of, you know, intuitive thing to do if you're going to publish a paper and you want to illustrate some point, then, you know, a lot of times what you can do is, and you will see that in the literature, have seen that in the literature. Uh, on a, a map like this, uh, people would uh, essentially uh, color or label somehow the enzymes or metabolites that they have measured and so on and so forth. So the view might be familiar to you even if you, even if you have not gone to that uh, site. So uh, the data in CAG database can be uh, accessed openly with any, without any license or any fee uh, through the uh, internet. And uh, several years ago, uh, they, they, are, they lost their government funding. Government of Japan stopped supporting them. And they were forced to go to a licensing mechanism. So there is a fee uh, to if you want to download the data. And uh, so this is just something to be aware of. I believe that. Um, access to CAG pathway is still available. I mean, to, in some limited capacity, they have an API uh, where you can sort of get access to this data, but uh, mostly you need to get a license. And so one of the, so it was, as I said, it was one of the uh, first databases of its kind. And one of the sort of drawbacks of CAG is that um, it was constructed, their pathways were constructed as reference pathways. And what I mean by this is that uh, any particular pathway may not exist in a specific organism as such. Okay? Some of the enzymes may be present in bacteria, and some of the enzymes may be present in uh, eukaryotes. Okay? And some may be in human, but not in plants, and so on and so forth. So they have these reference pathways. And, um, when it comes to, um, for example, you know, mapping your experimental data, it sometimes it's cre it creates complications, as you can imagine, right? So because I mean we don't have exact same metabolism as Drosophila or worms or something like that, right? And well, despite that, it's still a great database and a great source of data, and we use it a great deal, and I hope you will too. Okay. So the other database, if any of you are uh, uh, dealing with uh, bacteria and microorganisms, then you might be familiar with uh, this database, Biocyte. And this is a relatively large collection of uh, uh, organism-specific uh, pathways. Uh, and the f very first database that they constructed was actually for E. coli. And it's called EcoPsych, and this comes from uh, SRI International, uh, and uh, um, that group is uh, run by uh, Peter Karp. And uh, so they have several uh, uh, types of databases, and this is something to be aware if you try to use that in your pathway analysis. They have uh, several databases, as I said, EcoPsych is one, uh, the very first one that they constructed. And so tier one, what they call tier one databases are highly curated and um, a lot of times has been put into sort of, you know, maintenance and curation of these databases. And uh, then um, they have a group of databases that 
are called tier two databases. And uh, they uh, also, this group produced this uh, software that they co called Pathologic, uh, which essentially what it is, it's a tool where you can take any, for example, you know, bacterial genome, you can plug it into this software and it will speed out a metabolic reconstruction. As you can imagine, as just like any automated analysis, it will be sort of, you know, a starting point uh, for sort of, you know, building an elaborate database rather than sort of a complete product. And so, uh, uh, so what they did for this tier two database is essentially they produce, produced these automated predictions uh, of pathways, and then uh, there is a, um, as they say, one to four months of curation uh, by actually an expert, by by scientists, by experts. Uh, that were put into this, and uh, it's a bigger list, so I just didn't put it out there, but all of these are hyperlinked, and uh, so you can actually go there and take a look at them if you're interested. And then they have a very large list of tier two, uh, three di databases which uh, ha ha has, no, uh, ha uh, has not undergone any manual review whatsoever. Okay? So, uh, then uh, this is sort of the sort of you know base level. These are the old databases and more established databases. In recent years, um, a number of uh, high quality and higher resolution metabolic reconstructions have been published, and these are just sort of a couple of examples um, from relatively recent uh, publications uh, of the uh, human metabolic reconstructions. Okay, and so that is sort of the, uh, I'm sort of going through, through this in such detail because that's what uh, many tools for pathway analysis, including our own that we built here, uh, uses these databases. That's what on the background, and we'll take another look at that. Okay, again, there are references, uh, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, there are references to, you know, the respective publications, so you can take a look at them if you're interested. And these, by the way, some, or not these, but similar reconstructions are available for many other organisms, including mouse, including um, um, very, very, various microorganisms, yeast, and so on and so forth. Okay? So uh, then, uh, so now we talked a little bit about databases. So what is the uh, sort of, you know, goal of the pathway analysis tools? What, do, what, 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 what are they trying to accomplish in sort of most general sense? Well, I mean, the idea is to basically use all these pathways and try to put your experimental data in the context of metabolic pathways. That's sort of the basic idea, right? And so uh, utilize prior knowledge of metabolic networks, obviously, and uh, so, you know, visualize uh, multiple measurements across time points, observations, and so on and so forth, experimental conditions, right? And so I would like to, uh, here's what I would like to sort of, you know, say here, something about sort of data visualization. If you think about it, uh, data visualization uh, in this context, and I'm going to quote one of our uh, colleagues at UC Davis in metabolomics core, Dmitry Grapple. I don't know if it's his quote or somebody else's, but I first heard it from him. Uh, data visualization is really, is a form of data analysis, okay? So I cannot emphasize this enough, how important it is to visualize your data. Because, I mean, data is high throughput. You're not going to be able to see each time point. So it's extremely important. The more ways you have to look at your data, the more you are going to learn and uh, so the more confident or less confident, depending on sort of, you know, the circumstances you're going to be in your data set. But that's important. It's better that you find that out before reviewers point that out to you, right? So we all have been in these situations, uh, supposedly. So anyway, so this is one of the, again, very first tools of this kind. It's called Omics Viewer. And this is from Peter Karp's group again. This is part of their tool set. And so uh, it's... Uh, I mean, the great thing about it is that you don't really have to zoom in too much to, uh, I mean, you can probably guess that, you know, this would be a, a TCA cycle here and this would be a glycolysis. And so th th their sort of, you know, map is very sort of visually appealing and very intuitive and very easy to understand. And what I'm showing you here, what is visualized in their 
metabolic map uh, is an experimental data set. And so the edges and nodes in this are colored according to whatever, you know, changes in concentration. I cannot tell you what it is right now. Uh, I honestly don't know, but, you know, I had that slide for a long time. So there was some data set which sort of, you know, visual, uh, which is visualized here. And if you click on a particular pathway, it gives you this sort of, you know, zoomed in view of a pathway. Okay. So I will, uh, while I'm at it, I will point out one of the uh, limitations about this particular view, okay? In order to uh, draw this nice and neat pathway map, well, first of all, I mean, let me tell you, this is static, so this does not change. So it's basically, you know, an image, and we're sort of visualizing our experimental images over the uh, measurements over that image. But uh, in order to produce this nice and neat uh, map, um, if uh, you think about it, there are uh, multiple metabolites that are involved in many different pathways and reactions, right? So think about um, acetyl-CoA, think about ATP, think about, you know, any of those, right? So how do you draw that in, in such a nice and neat map? The only way to do that is to draw, uh, you know, show the same metabolite multiple times on this map, right? And so if you start to visualize your experimental data, it kind of, you know, creates a problem, right? So you don't know whether metabolites go, uh, what it means that metabolite um, goes up here and here, and you kind of don't have the connectivity between pathways immediately from that. But anyway, um, that's sort of, you know, a useful way to uh, visualize data, and it's, def it's a definite step forward uh, compared to printing out keg pathway chart and taking a highlighter and just, you know, showing uh, things on that sort of map. I always joke that, you know, highlighter is my favorite bioinformatics tool. So anyway, uh, so uh, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to mention a couple of commercial tools, full disclosure. I have absolutely no sort of, you know, financial interest or stake in uh, any of this. So it's not an advertisement. And so uh, the reason I mentioned, uh, so this one, uh, this particular tool uh, is called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis from the company called Ingenuity. And I mentioned it because I know that a lot of people who work with gene expression data actually um, have access to it or worked with it. And I just want to point out that essentially it has, the, uh, it gives you the ability to load your metabolomics data. and. I have not used it in a long time. I mean, I've used it for gene expression data. I have not worked a whole lot with it, uh, with metabolomics data myself. But if you already have access to this quite expensive tool, and if you're already familiar with it, I think it's worth a try to see what it will do for you. If you don't, maybe then, you know, you're okay starting with some open source tools. So it depends, right? Another commercial tool is Right, and so uh, this is sort of more of a network style display where, you know, there are different, obviously, you know, enzymes and, um, you know, whole pathways. And I believe that this are hyperlinked. So if you click on, like, you know, pathway, it will just show you the sort of map specific to this pathway and so on, right? Another commercial tool that is out there and also extensively has been used uh, uh, for gene expression data and sort of, you know, cited in many uh, publications is called Metacore uh, from the company called GeneGo here in Michigan, actually. Um, uh, so, you know, it also sort of, you know, it looks somewhat similar uh, to Ingenuity. I apologize for the quality of that image. I grabbed that from their website and it didn't come out very well. But uh, so the thing about uh, GeneGo and Ingenuity, I mean, what they, what they do have, and what is, I think, potentially a big advantage of using their tools is that they paid a lot of attention to drug metabolites, okay? And, I mean, I think if you think about it, it's not surprising. I mean, that's a commercial enterprise. You have to make money. And where do you make money? Well, when you sell it to pharma, okay? And pharma is interested in drugs, obviously. But if you already have access to this and if you are interested in uh, drug metabolism and, you know, any aspects of it, it can be a sort of, you know, big advantage Mm, sort of, you know, potentially uh, using these tools because none of the open source tools, with the exception of some databases that, you know, same David Vischer's group put together, I don't think, you know, paid much attention to it, at least not that I know of, okay? 
So here's yet another tool uh, uh, for visualization uh, and analysis of uh, metabolomics data, which has a number of uh, sort of you know advantages and disadvantages. It has some statistical tools as part of that uh, package. It comes from the group in Germany, and uh, um, I'm citing an early publication, but I think they published several sort of you know updated versions of the tool. And uh, so it has some of the types of analysis that George mentioned, and uh, you can try it. I personally found that the documentation for this tool is not very consistent, and the learning curve is pretty steep. So if you're willing to invest time, or maybe if you have a graduate student who is willing to invest time, or who, have no, who has no choice, uh, <laughs> it, may be a, it may be something to try. Okay? So... Uh, let me sort of, you know, pull back a little bit and uh, sort of, you know, make another sort of, you know, mm, sort of draw your attention to why you know, we actually uh, need these tools. And so I already said that, you know, sort of visualize, visualize, visualize. And the human mind is uh, very visual. And so we, it's easier for us to comprehend data that are presented in a visual way. I mean, it's much easier to look at the schematic diagram than an, ex than a, than an Excel spreadsheet. Graph is better, right? Or diagram or something like this. And uh, so uh, data are certainly high con uh, content. And uh, so, you know, we want to know the uh, context when we're examining experimental data. And uh, I already talked a lot, I think, about metabolic networks and you know, we certainly want to look at metabolites in this case and enzymes and, you know, any other sort of molecules that we're examining as a whole, not as sort of, you know, individual molecules. And um, I also mentioned multiple observations uh, across time points and so on and so forth. And uh, so the topic of my talk um, on Wednesday, I think, is uh, integration of multidimensional data. So we will talk about that. And uh, you really want to... So we ultimately, a lot of us are trying to understand um, something about human diseases, and that's sort of, you know, uh, something that would be useful to have. So next I'm going to talk about our own tool, which I think, you know, I'm not biased in any way, of course, but <laughs> that we developed here. And uh, so um, I think it would be sort of, you know, a good time to mention a great group of developers, uh, uh, present and past, that have worked on this uh, tool. Bill Duran is actually here, and he's going to uh, lead the hands-on demo where you guys, uh, on, the, on Thursday, where you guys will get a chance to try this tool. Terry uh, has been involved in development of Medscape from the very beginning. And uh, Glenn Tarsia, um, who since have left the group, but is still here at the university, and uh, uh, um, Tim um, uh, have actually, you know, since joined the Cytoscape group uh, in San Diego. So uh, I think I'm running ahead of myself, but basically, you know, it was said already that Netscape is a plugin for an open source uh, um, platform, Cytoscape, that has been developed by Trey uh, Eidecker's group, and uh, who is now in San Diego. And uh, so it uses one of these metabolic, human metabolic reconstructions that I've mentioned to you, uh, that is called Edinburgh Human Metabolic Network, or EHMN. And uh, we are in the process of uh, updating our database to the latest version of uh, human metabolic reconstructions that consolidated several sort of, you know, reconstructions from several groups. And uh, so my student, Yu Heng, Chang, who is also here, is actually working on updating that database, and we're making great progress on that. And so this is sort of the basic workflow and the basic idea that we had for Medscape. So you can start with metabolomics data and or gene expression data, if you have gene expression data. And uh, so uh, you can also do uh, some of the enrichment analysis on gene expression data, and you can put all these three types of files into Medscape and produce these different networks, but we're going to see it in some more, you know, in some more details later on. Uh, this is our web page, and it has a lot of instructions, and you will hear a lot more about Medscape and how to 
uh, work with this tool and how to download the tool. So uh, this is sort of, you know, drilling down a little bit on the uh, framework. And so I mentioned to you that, you know, metabolic reconstructions. But I think, you know, the heart of it, and that's what, what is very important for this sort of, you know, idea of data integration. Uh, so the essence of the sort of, you know, data that is on, uh, in our database, so basically, you know, these are the basic objects in the database. We have compounds, we have reactions, and uh, we have um, enzymes, and these are ultimately, you know, we understand that these are proteins encoded by genes, right? And as far as the database is concerned, all of these relationships are many to many, as you can imagine. So multiple compounds can participate in the same reaction, and uh, um, the um, reactions, um, you know, can be catalyzed by different enzymes, and different enzymes can catalyze different reactions, and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, now, when I say that this is sort of a very basic framework for data analysis, uh, you might have a question. So we're talking about pathway analysis. So where are pathways? So why, you know, pathways are not part of that. And this is sort of an interesting question because, uh, well, you know, if you think about it, in, we do, in our tool, we do have a notion of pathway, of course, and, you know, we'll show you, the, you know, uh, how you can filter data by different pathways and sort of, you know, display path pathway-specific networks. But if you think about it, the notion of pathway is somewhat artificial in a sense that, you know, it's sort of arbitrary how you combine different reactions into pathways. I think it's sort of, you know, something that uh, we're using essentially for, um, you know, as a sort of convenient way to describe a group of uh, biochemical reactions or, you know, certain functions. Uh, and uh, so uh, this sort of, you know, creates a lot of confusion because, I mean, what different pathways call uh, what different databases call a pathway, sort of, you know, you can find sort of, you know, different groups of genes and, you know, and this and so on and so forth. So I think I have to kind of um, rush through this, uh, through this, so I will not sort of, you know, I'll just sort of show it to you as a preview. We will talk a lot more about uh, that in the days to come. And uh, so um, I think, again, I'll just sort of, you know, uh, just sort of, you know, to summarize, this is a, a tool where you can input genes, metabolites, and proteins, and pathways. You can uh, do some, uh, you know, compare different sort of, you know, groups uh, and states, and we will show it to you. And it does some dynamic visualization, which I'll mention tomorrow. And uh, so um, I will also talk tomorrow about some sort of, you know, future directions and what we're developing in this tool right now. But I would also like to um, talk to you about the tools that are out there developed by other groups for uh, pathway analysis. So this is the tool that uh, was developed by David Bishard's group and is now part of uh, this metaboanalyst package that we talked about. And uh, so this is sort of, you know, uh, trying to, uh, this tool is trying to calculate pathway impact. Uh, by essentially taking into uh, consideration uh, um, the sort of, you know, the, this idea of sort of, you know, node centrality. And I don't think I have really time to do it uh, justice, but there is extensive documentation for this tool. And uh, so this is essentially a recap of what George talked about at the end of his uh, presentation. Uh, so the you know function of the about the sort of pathway enrichment pathway analysis, and um, this diagram actually comes from this great review. So if you're interested, you can sort of take a closer look at it. But uh, basically, these are three three generations of pathway enrichment methods, and uh, all of this uh, has been sort of you know tried and developed in the context of analysis of gene expression data where you have thousands of uh, genes and, you know, in part it has been developed out of necessity to somehow rank and prioritize your genes and sort of focus on the important groups of genes rather than looking at the huge lists of like, you know, 800 significant genes or something like that. Okay. With metabolites, uh, we actually have a somewhat different situation in a sense that, you know, you heard that, you know, we don't, sometimes we don't have quite as many uh, 
uh, metabolites. I mean, untargeted study uh, can uh, measure a lot of features, but you know, a lot of these features are unknown and they can be identified with additional effort, but something needs to be done in order to identify this. So I will skip the uh, overrepresentation analysis because George already covered it. So this is my version of two by two table that George showed. And um, so uh, I will just sort of quickly stop here. Uh, the example of, uh, again, as George said, of uh, functional class scoring methods. The best known example is GSEA uh, tool from uh, Broad uh, Research Institute. And uh, so this idea has been very popular. And uh, so the same metabolist package has the implementation of this method for metabolites, which they call MSEA right here. And so this is this is a snapshot of a standalone tool, but like I said, it has been incorporated into MetaboAnalyst. And obviously, the advantage is that if you already analyzed that your data in MetaboAnalyst and identified your differentially expressed metabolites, your data is right there in the right format, so you can just submit it to a pathway analysis. Again, I urge you to be very careful when you do that, because a lot of times the statistical power is just not there. Okay, so uh, I mean, you will always get an answer. You will always get some sort of, you know, list of pathways. But um, if at the end of the day uh, we're talking about like, you know, one, two metabolites being mapped to a pathway, uh, it's not necessarily going to be, uh, you know, it's not necessarily going to be significant, basically. Okay, so I think you know the word, uh, the word of caution here, basically, you know, be sort of, you know, very critical and very skeptical of your results. So you have to really scrutinize them very hard. But nonetheless, that tool is available. And this is yet another tool. I think it's even more uh, popular from uh, the group in Spain. Uh, it also does uh, metabolite enrichment analysis, also web-based. And I think this one is relatively easy to use. And I think the advantage of this is that, you know, some, actually, you know, some uh, CAM informatics people were uh, involved in uh, development of this tool, so I think uh, they that allowed them to incorporate uh, chemical taxonomy uh, and uh, some information about chemical groups and so on and so forth. And I know that I have to uh, uh, wrap up. So um, the only other, uh, let me see what I have. Uh, so I have a couple more things that I want to mention. A couple more, a couple more sort of you know approaches. So uh, mm, so we said that you know the, the the statistical power is often not there to do this pathway enrichment analysis, basically. Okay, and uh, so uh, the sort of latest trend in uh, latest bioinformatics trend, I think, is and sort of, you know, trying to overcome this limitation. So this tool uh, called Mamichog, and I learned that this is actually a fish. This is an Indian name um, for small groups of things. And uh, so it's also a name of this fish. So uh, what this tool does, it essentially uh, uh, tries to incorporate all spectral features into whether they have been identified or not. So essentially, to, it, it ignores the sort of compound identi identification. And what they do instead, they basically, you know, take CAD database and uh, convert uh, the list of compounds into list of mass to charge ratios, okay? So they, and they kind of, you know, do their enrichment analysis uh, in MZ space rather than in compound space, okay? And so the claim is that it allows them, so they, com here's, uh, they compare the uh, what they call conventional approach, where you only like use known compounds, known compounds are red and unknown are gray, uh, and you only use these in your pathway an uh, enrichment analysis, and they claim that they kind of, you know, get this uh, all features incorporated, and uh, they get additional power through sort of incorporating multiple features. So I think, uh, I mean, I think it's certainly a very useful step in the right direction. Uh, you have to keep in mind that a lot of these tools are really sort of experimental, okay? And some are more mature than the others, but I think it's sort of fair to mention what ideas are out there. And while we are at it, 
I will mention that you know all the pathway tools that I have uh, um, talked about so far have some very serious limitations. And uh, so the main limitation is that the uh, pathway databases that all these tools use uh, have somewhat limited uh, coverage of uh, pathways. Primary metabolism is covered very well. Uh, the uh, secondary metabolism, lipid metabolism, is not covered nearly as well. And uh, in addition to this, uh, in, uh, there are you know, if you, there are exogenous metabolites and so on and so forth. So uh, when you take into account how many identified features these methods uh, produce, that sort of, you know, results in relatively small numbers. And our friends and colleagues at, um, um, uh, at UC Davis uh, Metabolomics Core uh, came up with yet another tool, which I have absolutely no time to talk about, because MISTI is angry with me, so I will try to carve some time during one of the other talks. And in, su in summary, I just want to say that uh, metabolomics is obviously a rapidly developing uh, field, and uh, the databases are changing very rapidly. I talked to you about compound IDs and such. And um, so new data analysis methods are being actively developed by many groups around the world, and uh, new tools appear very frequently. So, you know, six months from now, I think I would have to completely revamp my slides. So basically, you know, the idea is that you know, sometimes you feel like it's a moving target, really. Okay? And uh, so for updates, uh, visit Metabolomics Workbench. They keep a pretty well sort of score of this site. And I'll stop there. Thank you. The majority of tools, with the exception of this tool that I mentioned uh, towards the end, Mamichok, the majority of tools allow you to upload either a list of metabolite names and concentrations, for example, or uh, sometimes a list of compound IDs. It sort of depends on the tool. For example, we support uh, compound names and keg IDs. Okay, uh, Metabolanalyst allows you to uh, upload a list of either keg IDs, HMDB IDs, or names, for sure, maybe a few other kinds by now. And so uh, talk to me if you're interested. There are several quite useful tools out there for sort of, you know, doing AD conversions. Some work better than the others. But the majority of uh, tools expect name or some kind of common ID.